the Cannabis Business Coach. Hi, Mike Z here, author of the Cannabis Business Book, and you're listening to the Cannabis Business Coach Podcast, where I chat with and coach the highest performing entrepreneurs in the cannabis industry. Hi, Mike Z is, hi, Mike Z is, hi, Mike Z is, the Cannabis Business Coach. Hi, Mike Z here, and on today's episode of the Cannabis Business Coach Podcast, I'm joined by the elegant, fancy, dressed up just for me. Just kidding. He always looks this good. The I, found- I had to dress. I had to dress up for you, man. Uh, <laughs> I had to do it. I the contrast. The, the, that's right. The the founder and owner of yourhempcfo.com, Mr. Adam Remus. Adam, I'm so excited to have you on here today because I know we're going to laugh a lot and and I'll I will likely learn some some good stuff today cuz every time we've chatted thus far I always pick up some nuggets here and there so thank you so much for being here uh, if you don't mind can you just tell the the listeners or and the folks who may be watching a little more about your hempcfo.com and the work you do absolutely well first of all thank you so much for inviting me in into this podcast and and having the ability to talk to you and and your audience i've i've absolutely enjoyed all of our conversations uh that we've had to date and so um yes my name is adam remus i'm a cpa been a cpa for 24 25 years i feel like i'm really old um maybe i'm really old um anyway so um i have a variety of experiences from accounting to tax to CFO. I've been CFO of a publicly traded company um, on the New York Stock Exchange. I've been CFO of private companies. Um, and Your Hemp CFO was really created a couple of years back and, and really came from the idea that we realized very quickly inside the cannabis space, a lot of people are doing one thing. A lot of people are doing the bookkeeping. A lot of people are doing the sales and use tax returns. A lot of people are worrying about 280E tax returns. Some people are just focused on CFO. No one's doing it end to end. And so we came in and said, you know, let's do the smorgasbord. Let's not do a la carte, let's do smorgasbord and let's give everybody end to end. So for a small monthly fee, we provide cannabis companies here in the United States, a avenue to outsource their entire accounting department their tax needs, their CFO needs to us, and we handle it from end to end. And so we're not just doing one thing, we get involved with um, finding merchant processing and cannabis banking and everything you can imagine that a cannabis oriented bank, a uh, cannabis company needs, we do for our clients. Awesome. And as one of my previous guests, Leo Bridgewater said, it sounds like you do it all from the rooter to the tutor. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I've yeah. never heard that one before. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, so Adam, thank you for that intro. I, I want to ask you, in addition to all that, I it's my understanding that you're embarking on a new venture in the media space. Is that right? Can you tell me uh, about that? Yeah, you know, I never thought I would be an editor of an online magazine, but uh, that's just what I fell into, literally fell into the last few weeks. Um, the owner of Canna Investor Mag, which has over 120,000 subscribers, um, his name is Derwin, he has a, a grouping of magazines. It's not just Canna Investor Mag, it's Canna Investor CBD and Canna Investor Mag uh, U.S. and Canada, and, and he has this very, very large subscription based where he pushes out on a monthly and quarterly basis to 120,000 opted-in subscribers, all his magazines. And he supports that by um, basically getting ads and advertising revenues that um, is needed to support the magazine. But he's had this thought for quite a while, but he couldn't really find the right partner. And we started talking about PR and investor relations and a bunch of other things. And he's like, hey, could you help me with this? And so we started talking. And soon enough now, I'm co-founder and editor of Canna CFO Magazine, launching hopefully in mid to late January, maybe a little earlier. 
I know it's a few weeks away, but it's super duper exciting because the 120,000 people that he has primarily made up of investors and about 30, 35,000 people that are inside cannabis in, um, companies, CEOs, CFOs, those type of folks, all those will receive the magazine as well. So I am just beyond excited because it's going to, for the financial executive within the cannabis industry and even the CEOs, it's going to be providing them access to information like uh, not only accounting and tax that I'll be providing, but really more, spe more financial spectrum. So we're going to have the person who was the chairperson of the NCIA um, banking committee be a writer. Uh, we're going to have just one, one person after another after another in, in two, three, four pages spreads be writers on an ongoing basis. So we're just really excited. We're going to cover banking. We're going to cover um, HR. We're going to cover attorney and legal stuff, um, state by state, you know, issues, um, as well as, you know, investor relations. Uh, so we're really going to kind of cover the spectrum of from a CFO, from a controller, from a financial perspective, how do you get your um, your house in order? We even have a super duper unbelievable uh, nationwide compliance person that um, is going to be talking about compliance issues. So um, it's really a give back. It's really like me saying, hey, how can we help the community? Because there really isn't a lot the, of folks that are focusing on um, the canna business portion of the industry. And that's what we're trying to give back and look at. Awesome. It's really exciting. Awesome. Yeah. I think there's definitely a need for that. And if you need any writers to talk about, you know, high performance, managing your energy, getting the most out of your human capital. I know. A there guy you go. Who's written there the you go. I'm, I'm there, you know, Hey, I, i if you don't mind writing a, you know, two, three, four page article, for me, I'm happy to post it. Absolutely. Love to. Sweet. So Adam, let me take a step back. Let's, let's go back in time for a moment. I want to ask you, how did you get into this crazy industry or why? Uh, what's, what's the origin story there? You know, um, we've had friends and family who obviously have had medical issues. Everybody's had medical issues. And I've just seen the medical benefits of hemp, CBD, and, and cannabis really make some incredible, incredible changes to people's lives. Um, you know, we have a friend who has a daughter who um, has some severe, severe um, uh, issues from a, you know, mental head perspective. She, was, she had some major um, uh, surgeries and then all of a sudden she's provided these products and these products make a huge difference in her life. And then all of a sudden all our seizures go away and all these life altering things that these medicines can be and do if appropriately applied really, I think was pretty exciting for me. And um, I haven't had a medical degree. I'm not a physician. I don't have that, but I've just seen the practical application um, to fix problems in people's lives and add substantial value from their their life, you know, and and so that's kind of why um, this kind of fell in. And then um, I was asked to be part of a um, uh, MSO um, as their chief accounting officer, and and there I had the unique opportunity to understand and be involved in dispensaries and manufacturing and taking inventory in the middle of the night and as the quarter closed, as well as looking at the um, bill of materials and the specific processes of a manufacturing unit um, that that's working in this field. And so I really got to ingrain myself into the different processes throughout the entire life cycle and the supply chain from cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and then obviously storefront. So the combination really kind of set my path and and that's why I decided to kind of specialize in this. Awesome. And when was that with that, that MSO opportunity? Uh, when did you get started? Yeah, about a year ago, year and a half ago. Oh, yeah. no kidding. Oh, I didn't realize yeah, it was yeah, that last, recent. The last couple of years, I've been kind of off and on involved and just really, really involved uh, the last year and a half, two years. Almost everybody in one way wow. or another has really come into this last couple of years. There's hardly anyone who's been in many, many years. But you've been in a lot. 
So I don't know. It just depends. Uh, Off and on, right? You know, it's that's right. <laughs> and as the as the saying goes, it's like dog years and cannabis. So it is, isn't e- it? Even even to make it a year or two is uh, no small feat. No, I hear you. I hear you. So what is that? That's fourteen years, right? Two times seven. Yep. There you go. There you go. Well, I'm 14 years into it. You're 14 years into it as well. Dog I'm, years. I'm about 42 years into it. And dog <laughs> years, just about, which happens to be my favorite number. So that's nice. maybe, maybe it's a good time. That, that's where all the gray hairs come in from the beard and stuff. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> and that's, uh, how it, that's, that's why it's so old. I got it. I got it. Adam, let me ask you <laughs> from a financial standpoint, you know, from a number standpoint, What's... numbers why why are you asking me about numbers what do i know about numbers i just kidding. <laughs> what's a common <laughs> misconception about cannabis business or cannabis businesses what's something that a lot of outsiders <sighs> think is true or maybe even some people in the industry think is true but you know is wrong or not the case it's easy literally people think oh it's easy it's no big deal oh my god do they have a rude awakening coming for them oh my gosh there is so many complexities so many complexities if you think about cultivation right it's not i mean yeah you're growing a plant and no big deal no 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 no, 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 no. You've got strains. You've got to figure out from a chemical compost perspective. You've got all these technical aspects in just the cultivation. Forget about manufacturing and putting different pieces together to make sure that it makes sense. But, but the yields and, and um, the THC levels, you know, that's not easy to produce. And there's also so many opportunities for problems. One of my large grows um, in Arizona, and I'm nationwide, by the way, but one of my large grows in, in Arizona, they're in like 12 different rooms. They have 12 different rooms and two rooms, they had a completely pull because they're like, um, we've got this fungus. We know we're going to have a problem. Do we treat it? And let's get experts in here to figure out how to treat it and save it. Or do we just pull the whole thing? And luckily they're segmented by room so it gives them, and there's barriers, both from a, a ventilation perspective, but then also physical, then they can just pull and then replant and move forward. And that's what they decided to do. So um, there is just so many stories and so many horror stories where, you know, you think you grow and, and there's no problem whatsoever. Not easy to do. Not easy to do. I was, we were talking to another, um, it was actually a, a prospect, not some that's a client of ours. And she, it was so funny. She was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm getting a, a tax bill in 2016 and 17 for, you know, like $180,000, right, as a tax bill for, because she got audited and just the case scenario was the worst case scenario. She didn't have the right books. She couldn't support anything and the whole bit. She says, but then um, it turns out in 18, in 19 and 20, I've lost almost a million dollars, and which is going to be like uh, huge, huge losses. And can you carry it back and go backwards? I'm like, how did you lose a million dollars? She says, well, see, I planted, and that didn't work out. I mean, what do you mean it didn't work out? Well, I got this really weird fungus. And I planted again. But I didn't really clean it that well, so I got it again. <laughs> you didn't clean it that well? He says, no. I didn't really clean it to what they told me to clean it because I was just trying to do it really quickly because I wanted to get back into the into the game as quick as possible. <laughs> and then and then she took a third time. It was like five times she finally hired a grow master. Jeez. Yeah, it's the the shortcut that ends up taking much longer. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can you believe that? So now she's literally put in all this money. And of course we can help her with her debt because you can go backwards the losses and go and then go forward. So we're going to clean out her debt, but that's a very powerful and sad mistake she made. Right. So I, I'm here. Hearing... So is this easy? This is not easy. This no, is not easy at no, all. Definitely not. No. It may no. look easy. Don't, don't let my hoodie confuse you and let you think that it's easy. <laughs> it's, not. it's not, it's not easy whatsoever. I wish it was. 
I wish everybody was making money like head over toe. I wish it'd be fantastic. It's not that way. Right. It so, really isn't. You really have to have experts in your area and in your in 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 all aspects. And you know, everyone says, oh well, it's so expensive to operate in, in the cannabis industry. Well, yeah, because it's a specialized, focused area that's new, that has some experts, but not a lot. And the good ones are gonna charge. Yep. And, and whether that's compliance, whether that's accounting, whether that's um, even cultivation and, and getting some guidance from a grow master, absolutely they're gonna charge. Yep. And you know, it's a highly regulated, highly competitive industry. And yep. if you're on the plant touching side of things, can be quite capital intensive as well. So yes. certainly not easy. <laughs> the only yeah, thing very, easy very... is going out of business. <laughs> that's yes. pretty easy in this space. That's pretty easy. That's pretty easy. Although sometimes that's hard because then you have to get out of these contracts and, and the whole bit. It's not so easy. But Right, right. Um, no bankruptcy biggest... protection, all that exactly. stuff. Exactly. There's no bankruptcy. That's a good one. Yeah. There's no bank. It's an illegal activity. If it's an illegal activity, you can't get bankruptcy protection. That doesn't, that doesn't work. That's not one plus one. So um, the biggest advice is just trying to get experts and get help all the way through the process and, and have enough funding more than you ever think you need to really go down this road. Absolutely. I echo both of those sentiments. And Adam, you gave an example of uh, what I will call a lack of an operational safeguard and how easily that can just destroy a business from a financial standpoint. I'm wondering if there's any, mm -hmm. you know, financial safeguards or, or processes that might not be so obvious for someone that is coming from a more traditional business and getting into cannabis that, you know, something that they wouldn't really think of unless they had seriously done their research. Does that make sense, my question? Yeah, you know, um, I think I, I would really come up uh, to the idea of 280E taxes. I'm not going to dive into tax law and, and the specifics because I'm going to bore you and bore the audience. But um, at a very high level, to just give you an idea, um, it turns out most companies outside of cannabis, um, you can take your revenues minus all your costs, you get to net income, and then you get taxed. In cannabis, plant touching cannabis, you are only allowed to do revenues minus your cost of goods sold, and that's it. So your cost of goods sold for cultivation might just be what you put in the, in the ground, nutrients, water, that kind of stuff. But it turns out that if you are changing the molecular nature of the actual product, you're going from seed to flower. You're going from oh, I don't know, how about um, flour to oil or flour to gummy bear? You're changing the molecular nature. You're doing something to the actual product, not just splitting it up into dimes, but actually you know, doing something. Then you can actually take a tremendous amount of deductions called indirect expenses. And it's a reduction of income. It's not a deduction, it's called. But basically, at the end of the day, it is. Because all these indirect expenses, paying your people, paying the taxes on your people, paying um, everyone that you can think of and, and all the other expenses that are associated with a grow and with manufacturing, that could save you a tremendous amount of money. And if you're not doing it properly, you're not really having that set of books that is auditable because everyone in this industry is gonna get audited. Unfortunately, I hate to give you the bad news, but everybody is. Um, then, then you're really not protecting yourself in the long term, And you're not really saving the most money that you possibly can and taking the appropriate tax positions you should. Got it, yep. So- Unfortunately, it's not easy. Nothing's easy. <laughs> no. Well, I wish it was. Let me <laughs> let me ask you, Adam. What what would you say to someone who's looking to invest in the industry, doesn't know the industry well, you know? Because that this is one of the common questions I get all the time, and my answer is usually, 
don't do it. <laughs> do yourself <laughs> do yourself a favor. If if you if you don't know the industry and you want me to spoon feed you the, the opportunity, then it's probably not going to work out so well for you. But you know, I'm just curious what what you would say to someone who's you know maybe has a couple of hundred grand or a couple million bucks to put in, and and they say, you know, even like uh, what you know, should I start a grow? Should I start a dispensary? Should I start a, you know, and I'm a big proponent of ancillary, especially if you don't have that, what I'll call technical expertise of actually growing plants or manufacturing products or whatnot. But I'm curious what your perspective is on that. I, I guess where I'm originally, I'm thinking immediately, due diligence, due diligence, due diligence. And it's not just asking the owner group questions. That's not, that's just scratching the surface. Bring in your own experts. Pay that two, three, four, five grand. It's worth it. Bring in a due diligence compliance person. Give them, you know, let them sniff around for a couple hours and see if even it makes sense. Bring in a tax guy, bring in an accounting guy, bring in resources to really evaluate whether in fact, what the ownership group is saying is in fact true. Because nine times out of 10, when I see things blow up, it's because the foundation was not solid. And the solid foundation includes compliance being solid, your accounting books being solid, all the back office, all the stuff that no one ever wants to worry about, that stuff needs to be solid. And if it isn't, it's going to create huge issues and bite you in the ass. So that's really what the the number one thing is. And the second thing is, is that as you go through the supply chain and you go from cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and then storefront and or delivery, delivery is specific to California is separate. But as you're going up the food chain, the expertise level that you need, right? You don't need to know the chemical mania, uh, the chemical compounds if you're selling, but you do need to know it if you're cultivating and manufacturing. So there's less and less technical knowledge that you need as you're in the back end of the process selling directly to consumers. Many might argue with me and banter with me, but it's one thing to make it. It's another thing to sell it. So it'd be easier from a technical perspective to sell it than than to actually make it. And make sure you've got that THC levels there appropriate for the product. It makes me think of it practically sells itself, which is like my my favorite thing to hear (laughs) in an investment pitch where it's like, you know, this practically sells itself. It's like, no, it doesn't. No, Nothing it doesn't. sells itself. <laughs> I wish it was that easy. I right. wish it was that easy. There's nothing that sells itself. Right. That's right. okay. That's just how, how it works. And, you know, and it's just a misconception. It's just this whole misconception of the industry and the idea. This should be easy. It's no big deal. You know, they're, there's, they're, they're, they're high anyway. And when they come in to buy, so they'll just buy whatever. No, that's not how it works. Right. really at the end of the day it's it's going to be um those those solutions that are out there in the marketplace that are in the general marketplace the grocery stores and that that's really the explosion that's going to happen how is this how is your experience in cannabis different from other industries that you've been in and part two is what's been the biggest surprise thus far in working in this industry? Um, The biggest surprise, let me answer that one. Um, The hard part is, is the fragmentation. I work with a client in California and their laws are completely different than Florida, completely different. Florida, you can only sell what you grow. So it doesn't matter the quality there, generally speaking. Don't, don't have your Florida folks probably will be screaming at me. But at the end of the day, they're not going to sell really good quality there compared to a marketplace that's completely open like California and Oklahoma. Banking. Banking is a huge, huge thing 
that is really, really complicated. I'm actually on the board of directors for a cannabis bank called West Valley National Bank, and I'm on the board of directors and she, uh, chairman of their audit committee. And so I'm seeing cannabis applications and loan applications come through. And, you know, the sophistication of these, these places is not at all what you'd think for three, four, $10 million operations. You can kind of tell that based upon the answers to the questions that they have and the information that they fill out. So I guess the biggest surprise very, very quickly is uh, the non-sophistication of the industry, both in solutions that they provide and the defragmentation of the industry based upon um, everything. I mean, there's 400 different software programs and do they all talk to each other? No, not at all. No, nope. some of them integrate, but they're expensive. And so, you know, I have a client who's, you know, a cultivator, manufacturer, and storefront. And her question yesterday to me was, can I just get one program that kind of works through this? I'm like, yeah, you can. It's more expensive and it won't give you the bells and whistles that the cultivation does that you currently love. But yeah, we can do something, but you're going to have to sacrifice. You're not going to get, the, you're not going to be able to eat your entire apple pie um, and, and enjoy it. So, that's the issues that we started running into. And what was your first question? I'm sorry, what was so your first question? It's about how is how's this industry different from other industries uh, that you've worked in? The maturity, the maturity of the industry and the solutions that exist and, and being illegal, being illegal. I mean, you know, just to think, I'm working for a company at the federal level, federal folks think it's illegal. Well, CPAs are like, well, should I ethically do, well, we have an obligation to provide services to legal and illegal companies, right? So that, that gets us past that, but yeah, it's illegal. So there's all these different rules and regulations and things that people hinder and, and shy away from. But in fact, it's just like a regular business. They have their same issues. They've got their same HR issues and problems and, you know, whether it is uh, all the way from sexual harassment to, you know, not getting the right staff on the right day to do what they need to do. It's all about operations and it's all about the same type of businesses. And, and I just wish that, you know, one day this will get to a federal level that will be legalized. Uh, I think that the legislation right now is very promising. And I think with, um, Biden coming on board, it's definitely very promising from a national federal um, perspective, but we're not there yet. And, and until we get there, um, then we still are struggling with an illegal product. And at the end of the day, um, from a federal perspective, the delivery and the storefront folks and the distribution front folks, they're, they're traffickers. That's all it is, literally. They're, that's what they come down to. So let me ask you, you mentioned a bit about the, the future and when we might see some changes on the federal level. And I'm curious, I'm not going to ask you to predict when that might happen or what that might look like, because I don't think you have a crystal ball. And, you know, I, I know I, I, my guess is that you're not in the speculating business, but I, oh, I, I'll I, actually give you a prediction next four years. I think it'll be legal. You think so? Yeah. 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 I think the next four years, I think they'll, they'll come to some kind of compromise and they'll get it. And by the way, once it does become legal, just like uh, the farm act controlled, you know, one part of, of the industry, there's going to be issues and problems. It's not going to be just a clean slate. There'll still be issues, problems, and things to resolve. So um, cannabis accountants, cannabis attorneys, uh, still are going to have great jobs because there still be corks and things to worry about. It's just moving from one pile of illegality to a different pile of how do we comply with the new rules? Right. So that's what I was going to ask you is what do you see the the impact of legalization being from a, from a more kind of practical operational standpoint? And what I mean is, you know, for the folks who are operating right now you know what's uh, I, have, I have a friend who always used to say what's your plan how is your business going to pivot when legalization happens so so really my question is how do you expect 
the industry might change once federal legalization happens, or, or even if we see banking open up or the 280E issue getting resolved, which I, I think is either one of those are, are probably very likely in the next four years, um, maybe sooner even, but h- how do you think that's going to impact the industry dynamics from, from a high level? I think that they, these companies will be more profitable. I think that these companies will be able to use their energy on the production and the operation instead of administrative. Um, I, I think that these companies will have the opportunity to um, branch out into more of the supply chain because they're not going to be stuck in one portion of the supply chain. Um, I think that having the ability, and I still believe, and I advise my clients to do so, if you are a distributor, find a cult- cultivator to buddy up with. Not only are you going to get 280E, but you'll be able to control your product. That's huge right now. Huge. I mean, I can't tell you my delivery clients in California are screaming because they they get a fantastic strain and they really, really enjoy and their customer base really enjoys a, a particular strain and and the whole bit. And three months later, they can't get it anymore. Get it. Yep. And they're like, you know, I don't want to say they're druggies, but they're the guy, the, the customers are like, hey, I want that strain. I want that. And they're like, oh, we can't get it. Well, what, you know, there's no consistency in the marketplace. There's no availability of the same type of products flowing in. There's all these issues that you wouldn't think of because of the illegalities of it really now are, are it, it currently exists and hopefully would go away. So I think in, on some hands, I think a lot of companies will be able to probably, you know, do a lot of mergers and acquisitions as well as, and then do a lot of consolidation in the marketplace. Um, Oklahoma, for example, it's the wild, wild west in Oklahoma. Literally, the wild, wild west. I'm sure you're familiar with Oklahoma's rules. It's anybody can get a license and everybody's got a license and everybody's smoking and fantastic. But is it really good product? Is it really, you know, are they really efficiently operating? Are they really worrying about their and looking at it from a consolidated supply chain perspective? No, no, not all. I mean, you go to Oklahoma City and you'll see, you know, three uh, at the corners of each store. You know, the corners of a of a four way stop sign. Three out of four are CBD, hemp, you know, cannabis stores, and it's just oversaturated, and no one's making any money. Huh. That's amazing. Yep. And, so, and uh, prices for, for um, you know, a pound of uh, from a wholesale perspective are way cheaper and the quality is less than you go out to California, you go out to Washington, or you go out to Massachusetts or, or anything where else where it's much more of a controlled, you know, circumstance, situation. Right. So you mentioned hemp. And I want to ask you, given that you are your hemp CFO, I'm curious what you how you see the future of the hemp industry evolving in parallel to to you know the cannabis THC side of things, especially if there is a federal legalization in the next few years. How do you think that impacts hemp? I think uh, well, first of all, I'm I'm actually going to be kind of changing my name very quickly here. Instead of your hemp CFO, I'm going to be probably going to um, your Canna CFO. Um, because it's going to be across all the spectrum, because that's what our client base is typically. But um, I think that's a great question. I think the the more the merrier. That's plain and simple. The more the merrier, right? I think the legalization of um, of CBD and and the legalization of cannabis will attract more people to the industry and give them the opportunity to enjoy different products across the spectrum. So I guess that's where my answer is. I think it's going to be more attractive and more people and more consumers coming to the industry. I also feel, and this is just my gut feeling, and I don't know, this is my idea, but edibles 
of all different types in nature are really going to be the biggest thing coming up here in the next five to 10 years, much more so than any um, smoking thing that, that we do and, and as, a, as, an, as, a, as an industry. And I think it's edibles because it's, it's easier. It's people can do it in the run. People can you know, do it anywhere. Um, it's not having any secondhand smoke or any of those potential issues. Um, and so I think that edibles and, and things that you drink and you eat and your gummy bears and all that, all that I think is where it's going. Um, and I believe that you know, even in my storefront and delivery clients who start up a line and who start up a specific, um, you know, uh, SKU group. So they've got, you know, 10, 15, 20 products. They very quickly, because of sales, are bringing in more and more products because it is getting more and more popular. Yeah, I completely agree with you there. It's something I put in the book that I think the oh, first see? mainstream like really well-known cannabis brands. Cause I, I, in my judgment, there really isn't any Apple or Nike or McDonald's of cannabis. I think the first ones will be edibles products or beverages, because again, it's not everyone smokes, not everyone vapes, not everyone dabs, but everybody eats. And yes. it's so it's, it's much more approachable and accessible. Agreed. And so I think uh, that's, well, in terms think, of mainstream adoption, that, that's where it's going to come. You know, I think the mainstream adoption might come from, you know, a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or someone really big and say, okay, boom. And they just buy literally the portion of the industry and they'll just consolidate everybody up and now they're pushing it out. So now you have a Coca-Cola or Pepsi or Sprite infused drink. Absolutely. I agree with that as well. I, I was at a future of food and ag tech conference now two years ago. Okay. And and all the big, you know, Kraft, Pepsi, Hershey's, CPGs yeah. of the world were all asking me, uh, how's CBD work? Can I put CBD in this? Or, you know, and they were basically all said, as soon as we get the green light from the FDA, no pun intended, we're definitely going to use cannabinoids as functional ingredients. You know, yep. it's just, it's, it's not a matter of if it's, it's just a question of when. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, you have to invite me the next time that you do that conference or you go to the one of those, cause I'd love to attend. Awesome. Um, but yeah. yes, I, I really think that that's where this is going. Yeah. So Adam, I want to shift gears to the coaching in a moment. I, before we do, I wanted to ask you if there's anything that we didn't cover or any thoughts that you wanted to share that we didn't get a chance to? No, I, I think that, um, I, I really think that the, we've kind of touched upon a lot of different things where this industry is moving towards um, uh, and, and really understand that impact. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I think that it really is something that is just exploding. I think that it's going to, with the federal laws, um, change everything very, very quickly. Um, and, and that's kind of what we're looking at and seeing. And, and it's, it's funny because you'd think that every business in the cannabis industry is profitable, but it's not. <laughs> it's not even close. I don't think that. <laughs> it's not even close. <laughs> right. You know, right, back right. to your comment, you know, back to your comment about, you know, what, what, what is good and to come into. You know, it's almost state by state. This is the last comment I want to make is, is state by state has such different rules and regulations and issues. In some cases, it's better to be a cultivator than a retailer. In some cases, it's better to be a retailer than a cultivator. In some cases, it's just better to be a distributor and, and pick which way you want to go, uphill or downhill. Right. You know, so I, it really I, just depends. It right. really depends. It's crazy. I, in a lot of cases, unfortunately, I'm going to tell people the cold, hard truth. It's better to just be a customer because you're not going to be ready for, for the work and the stress and the challenges and uncertainty of it all. And just as Adam said, it is anything but easy. So, you know, if you're thinking about getting into this space or investing into this space, I'm going to encourage you, like I do everyone, to really take a good look in the mirror 
and look inside and ask yourself, do I really want this? Am I really ready for this? Why am I doing this? Because if you think it's a quick or easy buck, I can assure you it isn't. And everything takes more time and everything takes more money and everything takes more patience. And, and I can go on and on and on. But yeah, dude, it's not easy at all. Yep. It's crazy. Awesome. So uh, on that note, Adam, I want to ask you, I'm going to put my coaching hat on. Okay. My, my coaching hood. All right. There's your, your hoodie. <laughs> what is a... I'm sorry. I didn't wear my hoodie today. I should have. <laughs> So I could match up with you and then, then we can go back and forth, you know? That's right. You know, <laughs> they actually, it's making me think of, I've seen like blazers or sports jackets with a hoodie on them, which there you go. looks as, as silly as it sounds, but maybe I should get one. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, we but could get be in the cool ones. group. Yeah, I could, <laughs> I could be in the cool group with you. There you we know? go. Oh, we'll nerd out and talk accounting. I, I love it. Hey, I, you know, I love accounting. I, I, I hated it in college, but as I've, gone on to business i'm like wow this stuff is is practically magic um but that's neither here nor there adam i they also ask say you, that about the product that's a beside <laughs> that's right but I, I knew that in college <laughs> oh you knew that in college okay you figured that one out okay yeah i figured that yeah. one out <laughs> adam i want to ask you <laughs> what is a current business buzzkill or roadblock that you're experiencing either with yourself or through a client and that maybe I can help you out today with a little bit of coaching. Wow. Um, the first thing I'm thinking of is a client of mine that's called um, Canna Market Square. Uh, it's, it's called Fuego um, a Group and it's up in Northern California and small little town and they, uh, they, they need investment at the end of the day. And I've been trying to work with them, trying to find investors to assist. Um, there's a lot of people out there, but because of COVID, I think there's a lot of cold feet that, that people are portraying when it comes to trying to find investment and, and trying to find appropriate investors. But in this case, what they're trying to do is they've got this building that's literally in a square and they have different offices, I want to say, are different units. And they want to do everything. They want to do cultivation, manufacturing, distribution. Um, they want to do nursery and even, and then obviously storefront and delivery. And there really isn't a quote unquote nursery that is coupled up with a cultivation and manufacturing company. So if I'm a delivery company and I'm up in Oakland, for example, and I wanted to make sure I've got consistent product that I control, that I know my delivery schedule is going to be. I know what's going to happen to it in the future. This is the place. Because all of a sudden, you can pick out your genetics. And then you can say, hey, grow it for me and or manufacture it for me. And, and, and have it in this schedule for this price. And now all of a sudden, you've, without doing the licensing, you've outsourced it, without doing all of the physical manufacturing and the hard work, you're just, you're, you're doing the, being the storefront and in front of the consumers, you can now have a dedicated custom line for yourself and your customers to really enjoy. And, and I think that they've got an idea, and I think that they've got the right mix. It's just money infusion is what's needed now. Got it. So I'm, I'm hearing a little about the deal and the business, but I'm wondering as far as the challenge of raising the money for the deal and just ballpark, how much money are we talking about here? Well, um, we need, um, we need about $500,000 for um, uh, about a million. These equipment loans usually have to put in about 50, 60, 50%. So you put in 500,000, you'll get 500,000 as equipment loan and, and that will finish up their cultivation unit and get all the equipment, uh, HVAC, the lights, the, um, uh, all of the tables, you know, all the stuff that they need from, from that perspective just to get the cultivation up and running. But what they're looking also for is managing partners for each one of these individual LLCs. 
So they're looking for like a two, $300,000 investment to be a 20% partner of each one of these LLCs. So to be inside manufacturing, to be inside distribution, to be inside delivery and nursery. Um, and so we're looking for multiple partners potentially, or maybe one partner to kind of gobble up. Uh, ideally, you know, we could use two, three million dollars very easily, but um, initially $500,000 and then being part as a managing director um, for each one of these entities is kind of what we're looking for. I see. And it sounds complicated. <laughs> I know. Nothing's easy. Nothing's yeah. easy. So I wish it was. What's the roadblock? What, you know, I heard you say maybe it's COVID, but I'm wondering, you know, have you had investor meetings? Have you had people who are interested, but just not ready to commit or? Many, many investor meetings, investors just not ready to commit. Uh, an investor, inv I, I almost say buyers are liars sometimes. An investor says, oh yeah, I got the money. I got the money. I got the money. But okay, well, here's the deal we're talking about sign on the dotted line and bring us your money. And they might sign on the dotted line, but never bring us the money. We're like, um, you see, this is a two-step process. It's not just one step, you know, hello. Um, so <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally they'll sign, but then they won't bring the money. We're like, uh, it's been two months. It's been three months and we're, what's going on here? You know, but no, um, these are the things and the challenges that we've got. We're just, I hate to say buyers are liars, but we're just not finding the right group of investors that are willing to put up the money and be active partners with us. Right. So I'm wondering then if you're talking to the right kind of investors. Or... Potentially. Yeah. I mean, we could do the crowdfunding, but then that's just hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people. And that's one option, you know, thousands to, take little pieces. It's not like we were trying to manage and that's an investor relations nightmare in my opinion, but that might be an idea. Um, but we we're just looking for a few folks that had some money that wanted to get into this industry, but didn't necessarily have the technical expertise, but had some business um, skills um, and, and wanted to kind of grow this with this unbelievable idea where the local community and the mayor and the city council have all blessed this group and all have said, yes, we're only going to assign a, one or two licenses and these guys get one. And um, that's, uh, I think it's going to be a great, great opportunity for the right investor. So who is the right investor or what, what might the right, right investor look like for this deal? Oh, <sighs> Someone who's more than 18 years old. <laughs> I just had to put it out there. Could sign a legal contract. That's, that's a reasonable expectation. Right? Um, who has money. Who sees the vision. Who understands that not only are they going to do their own grow, manufacturing, distribution, but they're really going to be able to serve the bigger community by providing a opportunity for other retail retailers to participate and custom design specific cannabinoid and, and CBD and, and, um, and uh, um, cannabis products for their local community. And there's a lot of science that's going to be going into this, as you can imagine, and it's going to be a 100% organic. There's not going to be any, um, you know, non-organic items in the soil or anything else whatsoever. But um, it's really going to be a clean and wonderful operation. And the managing partners is a couple that I really believe in, and I think they're a great couple. And I think that they're really going to do some great things. So. You got to find the right people to partner up with. That's one of the biggest issues here uh, that are not, you know, just full of crap and they're really true people, um, which we have. We've got uh, a couple of investors who have put in, you know, about a million dollars so far into the project. And we're looking to kind of build this out even more to, to find the right partners. Where might you find these right partners? Well, 
if anyone out there knows of someone who might be interested, let me know. <laughs> That's one option, right? No, um, we're looking at different ways to get the word out. Um, uh, and then obviously maybe using my magazine to potentially, you know, get get in front of investors and, and other folks. Um, so that's, uh, we're, we're looking at variety of different ways to kind of get the, the word out um, to think about, but to find investors. I'm curious if there are any existing operations that have a similar model to what these folks are trying to build. So, you know, maybe you could there find may be. folks that really like this concept already yep. and have already put money into it and who might that be and where might you find them? Because yeah. it sounds almost like a little bit of like a, not necessarily like a WeWork, but uh, but like a co-op, yeah, in a sense, model, yeah, kind of like that in a sense, yeah. You could so, consider it that way. There, there, that might be a way to to go after that, and we we might think about that. Absolutely, that's so a great I'm, idea. I'm thinking about Flocana, up in uh, the Emerald Triangle. Are you familiar yes. with them? Yes, I don't know anyone over there. So. You? Yes, I do. And okay. so, you know, they have this kind of, you know, it sounds like at a, uh, at a larger scale, what they've done, as I understand, is um, bucket together a bunch of the mom and pop artisanal local yep. growers and, and give them an umbrella and give them the scale that they yep. don't have access to, Yep. which to me sounds similar to what you're describing. Potentially, yeah. In I mean, these guys want to, these guys want to do their own cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, but um, they also want to grow specific um, uh, specifically for others in the community and the, and throughout the throughout California, which is their nursery piece. So it's basically growing the specific genetics. And I'm I'm curious, and I'm I'm just I I'm just gonna check this out on a hunch because I I don't know the pitch and the deal and the operators and the details, but I'm curious, why not just go? It sounds to me, and I could be totally wrong that like the nursery is the big differentiator here. And so I'm wondering why not just go all in on the nursery or go, you know, 80% into the nursery, start with that and then expand to all the other stuff. And again, I well, could be California totally wrong. Yeah, no, California. Um, so I guess where I'm going is state by state, there's different, you know, regs. And the cultivators, unless you unfortunately, God forbid, got uh, had an issue with the fires, um, the cultivators are really making the money in California. So we need to kind of get one of these operations up and running as quick as possible. And the cultivation seemed like it was the biggest bang for the initial dollar to get up and running, to then have the revenues to put in to maintenance, distribution, storefront, et cetera. Once you're up with cultivation, then it's very easy because you've got the, the plumbing, you've got the equipment, you've got all those other pieces to then check up and say, okay, I want a nursery because it's the same flow. It's the same, all these other pieces. So um, it made sense to start up with cultivation because we wanted to start with product and grow product and sell product. Um, and, and get money in the door and flow through, then going after each one of the uh, distributors, storefronts, um, and, and delivery and say, hey, let's do a custom package for you. That might be more of a sales process uh, to handle and as the next steps. But uh, once we get our name out there and understand and have people understand, I think everyone's gonna flock to this idea of having and being able to create custom products for themselves to then exclusively sell. And most importantly, no, yeah, I'm going to get this product in four weeks. I'm going to get another delivery in four weeks. I'm going to, you know, and having that perpetual delivery system and allowing them to see how it works and, and be able to up the production or decrease the production because now Canna Marketplace is their back end back office, back production supplier. Got it. Interesting. So. Good thoughts, yeah. huh? Really interesting. I think and this interesting. is just one of, uh, you know, the 20, 30 clients that we've got that we've been working with. And, um, 
you know, it's just uh, one of those things where we've just really enjoyed working with our clients and we're, we're working with them from every aspect, cultivation, manufacturing. And that's why this is not easy. It's not just, oh, let's just put a bookkeeper in there. Oh, let's just do tax stuff once a year. That's not how this works. It's not so easy. You really got to think through the 280E rules. You got to really think through from a strategic point of view, what's the best solution? And normally, in a normal business, you don't necessarily have taxes be a part of a M&A transaction or be part of a, of a major decision. But when you're dealing with illegal products and you've got these such tax burdens that whether you realize you have it or not, those should be entering uh, these discussions from a strategy point of view all the way throughout the year, not just once a year after the fact. I have two questions for you. One is, what do you think is the biggest obstacle from getting the right investor? You know, what hasn't happened yet that needs to happen? I don't know. Maybe it's the terrible CPA who's making the pitch. No, I'm sorry. Um, maybe, um, I don't know. I don't know why we haven't been able to find the right people. I think I hate to blame it on COVID, but people are shying against um, a little bit of this industry. Although California and other city, other states, um, it is a medical item. It's considered a medical necessity. It's never going to get shut down. No state is shutting it down to operations for any COVID-related issues. Um, but I think investors are just being shy right now until and waiting i think until the legalization kicks in until you know other opportunities right now also the marketplace um for stocks are skyrocketing and so there's other huge competition for that investor dollar that really is is screaming at them if the stock market was way 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 down there would probably be more people looking and fishing for other more palatable ideas from an investment standpoint. How long have you been trying to raise money for this deal? Um, about a year, off and on. But we've we've gotten very successful here, um, and 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 attracted the initial investors and done very well there. Um, but really, at the end of the day, I would say the last couple of months, really at the end of the day, we've been really hardcore and trying to look for folks. And then my, my last question for you, maybe, is... It's okay. I'm enjoying this. So you can just keep going. We'll banter yeah. back and forth. I'm cool. Yeah. yeah. My, my last question is, and maybe this is inappropriate. So uh, if it's a bad idea, you know, feel free to tell me I'm an idiot. Wouldn't be the first time. I'm wondering... You if... could ask my wife the same question. Should I just bring her on over? <laughs> I'm sure she'll tell you that I'm an idiot. Easy. No problem. <laughs> No, um, I was going to ask for, right? Let's go on. <laughs> I'm just going to ask you if you have, I imagine you have other cultivation clients. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, I would imagine at some point they've raised capital and they yes. have, they have investors who are familiar with the risks and the process yep. and, and yep. know, know the deal, if you will. Yep. Yep. And so I, I wonder if that's a network that you've tapped into or I have, or I've thought about to... that. No, 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 I have. And I've thought about that. Um, my current cultivation clients are not in the right timing in their life cycle of the business. For example, my Arizona grow, very large grow. It's going to go from this year in 2020 to having uh, $75,000 of income to five to eight million, five to six million in 2021. They're right in the crust. So I'm in the wrong timing for those investors to flip their investment to bring it over to another deal. Um, I've got those kind of scenarios where it's just a timing issue, but not a, because um, they want to reinvest their profits. They're going to want to reinvest their profits into something else. Um, for the Arizona client, they have a whole building that they can build up. So they may just self inflict so all the profits may just go to building another building and doubling up their production because right now arizona went to recreation and so they can't 
get enough produced for the marketplace. Um, but um, yes, I have absolutely thought about it. I mean, my clients, uh, I'm open about this and, and maybe this will, will hurt me in the long run. But if I've got a manufacturing client that delivers throughout California and they're, they're going to nursery, they're, they're going to storefronts and selling to storefronts, they're selling to distributors, you know, I'll confidentially say, hey, give me your product list and what you'd price it for, for more of an inside deal, quote unquote. I'm not going to tell them who you are, but I'll present it to them as, hey, I've got another client and this is what they're selling. If interested, then confidentially, I'll connect you guys. But yeah, we do that all the time for our clients because we're here from a CFO perspective, trying to help every single one grow. It's not, uh, so yes, I have reached out. We do use our network. We absolutely are one of those value partners to try to assist. Yeah, I wonder if in, in that scenario, and again, I'm just spitballing here, that you know that those, those investors for the Arizona grow, sounds like they're doing well and or they're about, about to, to, about to about be doing well. They're about to hit the lottery and do extremely well. So I wonder if, if they have investor friends that they might. have FOMO because, yep. you know, they're, they're hearing their buddy talking about how, how well right. they're about to be doing. So, so maybe that's the person. That, that might be a good group. Yeah. To. I might, I might think about that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I know um, the group wants to expand. I know the group um, is, you know, potentially thinking about creating a, uh, a lab there's only four labs or five labs in the entire state and they're completely overwhelmed and it takes three to four weeks to get your product out the door once you bring it in. Uh -huh. um, yeah, another issue that you don't think about as an investor walking in, it's not just, oh, I, I pick it, I dry it and I sell it. No, 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 Adam, this will be the, the last, last question for me, unless you have any questions for me. But um, Maybe I should flip the script and ask you about the book and help me understand about the book. But I, I got to get a signed copy sooner or later. Am I going right. to yeah, get a signed we, copy? I, I could arrange that. And yep. Now, do you book? have it in digital? So like, you know, I could just listen to it. And do you have you done that yet? You know, it's funny. I literally minutes before we got on the call, I got a notification that I'm trying to get the audio book yeah. on, online for sale. And I, I just found out it got rejected again for some like technical issue. You know, whoever mastered it for me apparently didn't do a good enough job. And so now Amazon wants me to clean up the files again. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a, you know, I'm pretty disappointed about it because I've had the thing ready to go for you know basically half the year at this point and because their process is not so user friendly you know i got i don't know whatever so hopefully i'll get it out there soon the audio book where you could hear yours truly narrating oh you're you know, gonna do it yourself i did do it myself oh you know? fantastic the okay. people they gotta hear from me directly that's from right. the horse's mouth you know that's right we gotta hear it from the horse's mouth <laughs> but uh I, I was gonna ask you you know, that, well, to answer your question about the book, the book is great. It's the best, best book ever. Of course, no, just... of course. I would not expect anything different than Michael Z's book. Absolutely. Yeah. No you know, problem. I, I got, I got to push that thing because, you know, as much as it sells itself, I have to sell it too. I know. I know. <laughs> so just like everything else. Yep. So Adam, let me ask you, what was your biggest <laughs> takeaway from our conversation? I think I'm going to talk to my Arizona investors and see if they may have some friends to um, potentially think about this opportunity. That was some really good ideas. Nice. Really good idea. Really good idea. Awesome. Cool. Good. I'm glad I could, uh, uh, you know, and you one good idea sometimes is that's it. It could, that's be, it. That's could it. be enough. Sometimes. And if we get funded just because of that idea, we'll, we'll get you something definitely on the road. Nice. I, I want a strain named after me. That's what I want. No. Well, that's hard to do. <laughs> Maybe you'll get me something else, but who? I don't know. you don't have to get me anything. <laughs> Adam, thank you so very much for your thank time you. today. A pleasure as always to chat and 
have a great new year if I don't see you before before then. And I'm sure I'll Happy see you Happy holidays soon. to you, you and your family. And, you know, fantastic. Best of luck with the book. And thank you so much for allowing me to join you on this podcast. Really enjoyed it. And just really wanted to, you know, kind of get the word out to not only what we do, but this great new magazine, like, uh, really, I think is going to add a lot of value to a lot of people. Yeah. Tell us the name again and where people can go and find the magazine. Well, um, it is going to be called um, Canna CFO Mag. And uh, we're still working out which website it's going to be, but it'll easily be hosted on the global website of CannaInvestorMag.com. And if you go to that, you'll see all the different family of um, individual magazines. And so we'll definitely be in there. Got it. So I'll be sure to link to Canna Investor Mag. Canna Investor Mag. Mac. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And until next time, Mike Z here on the Cannabis Business Coach Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. The Cannabis Business Coach. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. The Cannabis Business Coach.